I want to read, please, in the book of Jonah and the Old Testament. The Old Testament book of Jonah, <clears throat> one of those little books at the end of the Old Testament. Jonah chapter 1. <clears throat> the book of Jonah and chapter 1. And we'll read from verse 3. But Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord and went down to Joppa. And he found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare thereof and went down into it to go with them unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord sent out a great wind into the sea, and there was a mighty tempest in the sea, so that the ship was like to be broken. Then the mariners were afraid, and cried every man unto his God, and cast forth the ware that were in the ship into the sea, to lighten it of them. But Jonah was gone down into the sides of the ship, and he lay, and was fast asleep. So the shipmaster came to him, and said unto him, What meanest thou, O sleeper? Arise, call upon thy God, if so be that God will think upon us, that we perish not. And then the story continues, and We'll join it again at verse 12 here. Jonah chapter 1 and verse 12. And he said unto them, Take me up and cast me forth into the sea. So shall the sea be calm unto you. For I know that for my sake this great tempest is upon you. Nevertheless the men rode hard to bring it to the land, but they could not. For the sea wrought and was tempestuous against them. Wherefore they cried unto the Lord, and said, We beseech thee, O Lord, we beseech thee, let us not perish for this man's life, and lay not upon us innocent blood, for thou, O Lord, hast done as it pleased thee. So they took up Jonah, and cast him forth into the sea, and the sea ceased from her raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly, and offered a sacrifice unto the Lord, and made vows. Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Now we know the Lord will bless <clears throat> this reading from his word. This chapter that we have read from and the story that we have read is a favorite in Sunday schools and as children. I remember in our home, an old, an old Bible story book that was well worn with a white cover. And every now and again, very, very irregularly, but now and again, in the evening time, my father would have taken down this book and with some of us on his knee, he would have read one of the stories from, from that book. Jonah and the whale was one of the favorites. And we have read this story tonight because from this chapter, I want to show that there is in this chapter one of the clearest illustrations of how a soul can be saved. And likely there are in the audience tonight those who need to be saved. And I want to say to you now, dear friend, right at the outset of the meeting, that you could be saved this night in this meeting. Maybe you have come with no notion of being saved. When you woke this morning, being saved was the furthest thing from your mind. That was the case the day I was saved. The vast majority of the day I spent without any thought about my sin or my soul. I wasn't missing meals. I wasn't disturbed in any way. But before nighttime came, I was on the way to heaven. And I would love, I would love that some soul even now and I'll not keep you beyond the time, that you would now, tonight, in this meeting, give serious thought to being saved, and resolve within your heart that I'm going to have this settled tonight in the meeting. Now, now from this chapter you say, well, <laughs> I, I had never thought that I would be saved in a meeting, let alone in a meeting where a man was read, reading from Jonah chapter 1. Surely, if I'm ever going to be saved, the man will have to be reading from Isaiah 53 or John 3 
Well, you listen tonight, and I hope by the help of God to show you how you can be saved. Now, I want to see from this chapter a number of things, a number of lessons that we learn. And the first thing I want us to notice or to remember is that all the men on this ship, they were on a voyage across the sea. And the men who were on this ship, as they made their voyage, they were on a journey that was going to end in them perishing. And they needed to be saved. Now, I'll say as well that I know that's very simple. But it's what we have here in this chapter. All the men of the ship, every one of them, they were facing the end of the journey that was not so far away for them. And the end of the journey was going to spell disaster. They were going to perish. And the greatest need they had at this moment, as we find them in this chapter, the greatest need they had was they needed to be saved from perishing. And your need is the very same. Every one of us in this room, everyone in the town of Ballyclare, but our interest now is in all who have gathered here. Every one of us are travelers to eternity. Every one of us. As we have been born into this world, that journey that we are on is going to end. I just put it like this. It's going to end in tragedy. Because if you live and die in this world, or if the Lord comes and you're not saved, dear friend, listen, and I'm not here to scold at anyone, I would love tonight some soul in this meeting would be serious about being saved. Because we're serious about you being saved. So are the Christians that are praying. But I would love that you would realize this journey you're on, dear friend, is going to end in you perishing. That's why you need to be saved. And while while they are on this journey, <clears throat> there are there are men on the ship. Some of them are afraid. That's what we read in the chapter. I think it was verse number verse number five. The mariners were afraid. They were the men I judge. And you'll allow me to paint the picture if I can at all. They were the men who were on the ship. They were standing upon the deck of the ship looking at the storm. And they realized this storm is going to beat us. And we're going to perish. And they were afraid. I remember times in my experience, likely many others here can recount the same thing. There are many, many times in my experience when I thought about eternity, I was afraid. When I thought about the coming of the Lord, I was afraid. And I would love tonight, I know, I know these things are not easy thought about. And there's something within us shies away from them. It's in human nature, even, even leaving aside spiritual realities. People don't like to face bad news. They don't like to face people put off going to the doctor because they're worried what he might tell them. It doesn't change what they have. But they don't want to face it. And I know it's troubling to face it, but the one thing about these men I say about them is this. They looked into the storm and they realized that we're facing a future that is not so long and we're going to perish. And I would love that some soul tonight in this meeting would face eternal realities. That's what they were praying for in the prayer meeting. That I have eternity to face. And I know I need to be saved. But as yet I'm not saved. And if I go on in the way I'm going, I'm going to perish. This will be a grand meeting. You know, everyone, everyone who gets saved, and we're not here to lay down rules or regulations, but in all the stories of conversion that I have heard, and I've heard a few, there comes a moment when people face reality. I need to be saved. Or I'm going to be lost. And I want to be saved, and I want it now. But there not only, there not only were men on this ship who were afraid. They were the men facing the storm. They were the men facing perishing. 
but there was a man, there was a man on the ship here, and he was sleepy. You imagine, you imagine being on the ship, and all the men on the ship, they're terrified. And the ship being tossed about in the storm, and yet here is a man, and he is sleepy, facing the same end. And it tells us why he was able to sleep. It says here that he had gone down, he had gone down into the sides of the ship, and he lay and was fast asleep. You see, this man, this man, he didn't bother looking at the storm. He didn't bother facing the end of the journey. He didn't want to be troubled about thinking about perishing. And so he went down, he went down into the sides of the ship and he tucked himself away and he lay down and he was just fast asleep. Never faced a thing at all. You know, that's like these two categories that I'm speaking of now are just like people who come to our meetings. There are people who can come and go to meetings. It takes nothing out of them. It's just another meeting. And the preaching can be whatever it is. It doesn't fizz on them because they're not prepared to face it. And then there are others, they come to the same meetings and they do face it. And they say, it's time I was saved. You know, I remember, remember well a man I worked with in Belfast, a man, like I've told it here before, a man called Alistair, a very dear man, a very, very, very kind to me many ways. And I remember I was having a, taking a meeting round the corner from where he lived. Not very far, he could have walked to the meeting. I remember I went in one day through the week and I asked him, I said, Alistair, I'm preaching such and such a place. Oh, he says, I know that. He says, I says, well, I'm there on Sunday night. I'd love you to come. Would you come and hear me? Meeting's only an hour. You pay nothing. Sit and listen. And I remember still the look on his face. He says, oh, David, he says, I wish you hadn't asked me, for I don't want to say no, but he says, I'll not be there. I had thought, I had hoped he might come. I said, tell me, Alistair, I says, tell me, if you don't mind telling me, why would you not come? He says, when I was a little boy, I sat in meetings like that every week until I was 15, and we moved to another place. And he says, very soon after that, I left home. And he says, from 15 until now, a man in his mid-fifties, from then until now, he says, I have not sat in any meeting like that since then. And he says, I know, I know if I went to your meeting that what I would hear would only disturb me. So he says, if you don't mind, I appreciate the invitation, but if you don't mind, I'm not going. You know what he was like? He was like the man who had gone down into the sides of the ship and was fast asleep. His end is no different from all those who are disturbed about it. The only difference is he doesn't want to face it. Oh, listen, dear friend, is there not in this meeting tonight, you say, I've come to the meeting. Yes, dear soul, and we're glad you're here. But is there not somewhere in these seats tonight a soul in this meeting that will be prepared to face the truth that without Christ I'm perishing and of all things I need in life, I need a Savior urgently before I perish, lose my soul. They were facing shipwreck, perishing. Some were afraid, some slept. The third thing I want us to notice about this trip is that as the journey went on, the things, the things of the ship, the things that were in the ship became less important. You see, the talks here in one of these verses about the wares, the wares that were in the ship. That's just the things they had, they had filled the ship with. You know, whenever the ship was in the harbor, they filled it with these things called the ware. They were important things, at least so they thought. And when the ship was in the harbour, and whenever they were in the calm, they, t- they took great care, and they, 
They loaded on all the things they thought they would need for the journey. And they filled the ship with. And the passengers got on, and off they set sail. But here, as the journey goes on, and as the journey nears its end, and as they are near perishing, all the things that seemed so important in the harbour, the things that they thought were vital for their journey, they now realise those things are of no consequence whatsoever. And they threw them overboard. Is that not like human life? We pack into our little ships everything that we think is important. And I'm pleased I'm not decrying any of these things. I'm only making the point. And you know it's true. You know it's true. We pack in, we pack in education. And I had an education. I wish I had more. And I wish I had paid more heed. But we pack in education. It's important for the journey, is it not? You know the thing, dear friend, at the end of the journey, it doesn't matter that. You say, well, I wouldn't be just so strong. Well, I would. We pack in our career, our job, our business. It's so important to us. We devote so much time to it. We pack in relationships and everything that is dear to us and our family and so on. And as I say, I'm not decrying any of those things. But you know this, dear friend, when the end of the journey comes, and it comes to us all, you know the only thing will matter for you is this. Did I ever get saved on this journey? You remember the Philippine jailer on that night, whenever he was facing death, he thought death was just right in front of him. Tell me, what was he talking about? How good a father he had been. How nice a home he had. How well he had done in the prison. Likely started fairly well down and had worked himself up to be the keeper of the prison. Likely ran it well. Is that what he was talking about? What must I do to be saved? He says, I realise now the most important thing is this, is that I am saved and I am not saved. Tell me, how can I be saved? You say, well, that's all very well and good. That's all very well and good. That's fine for for the man at the end of the journey. But I'm hardly just at the end of the journey yet. Well, I'll say this to each one of us. The time to prepare for the end of the journey is now. You'll pardon the personal reference. And I know my father would excuse me as well. But when I left the city hospital with him on the 29th of January, I would say he hasn't had a clear mind from then until now to think about the end and about getting saved. I'll never forget on the way home, it was about Temple Patrick before anyone spoke. And you know what he said was this, I'm mighty glad that as a boy of 14, I made preparation for today. The time, dear soul, to prepare is now. The time to be saved is now. Not even tomorrow, not tonight when you get home. Tonight in this meeting, just now, make preparation for the end. Make sure you're saved. For all the, you see, I know, I know there are things that are dear in life. Goodness, we all have them. But the vital thing, dear friend, is this. It's my soul saved. You say, well, I haven't seen yet how I can be saved. Well, let me come on to that, or at least get closer to it. Because I want to see that these men on the ship, all of them, they had to learn one vital lesson before they were ever saved. They had to learn that their salvation would come not by them putting in more effort and trying harder. You see, we read here, these men knew they were perishing. They knew they needed to be saved. I'm sure everyone here knows they're perishing. And you know you need to be saved. They even, it's coming to me now, they even had been told the plan of salvation. But what did they do? They knew they were perishing, 
They knew they needed to be saved. They heard a plan of salvation. You see, they'll, they'll grasp that plan of salvation with both hands. They'll be so glad for it. What does it say? Nevertheless, the men rode harder. Not amazing. They rode harder. These men said, okay, I know we're perishing. We've heard of one way of salvation. Nobody has any other way. But we're going to leave it aside and we're going to row as hard as we can. You'll, you'll allow me here. There's no one too hard on us here. These men were so stubborn and obstinate. They said, we'll do this ourselves. You know, I don't know. When I was reading through this chapter, I could see this just as a picture of so many. They know they need to be saved. They know they're perishing. It's not that they don't know the gospel. They've heard the gospel. They know there's one way of salvation, faith in Christ. But my, they will do everything but trust him. And it's not its not that they're rowing just kind of lackadaisically. They're rowing hard. And if salvation came by effort, they would have they ha- would have an A star. But the men had to learn it was not in rowing hard. You know, I want to say, just in case there's any here or in any way confused, that the salvation that you need is not found in attending a place or joining a church or signing a card or saying a prayer or turning over a new leaf, or going to meetings, or reading more verses, or spending more nights. That's not how salvation is found. You say, oh, well, you need to be careful here. You need to be careful. You're telling people just, they'll just walk into, daydream into salvation someday. No, no, no. I'll tell you this. You see, if you're not serious about being saved, you'll never have it. But one thing you'll learn is this that we are without strength to save ourselves. And these men thought if they put all their effort into rowing, that they could manage, they could manage themselves. But they had to give, before they were saved, they had to give the rowing up. You say, well then, tell us, tell us. For I promise to let you home in good time. Tell us how were these men saved? Well, I wonder, I know... All our, all our minds stray at times in meetings. I wonder, can we all just now for five minutes think on how these men were saved? Not in them rowing harder. You say, well, tell us, when were the men saved? I'll tell you when. These men on the ship were saved whenever there was one went down into the storm for them. That's when they were saved. And these men on the ship, they stood, men in fear of perishing. They stood at the side of the ship, and they watched a man descend into the depths of the ocean and into the midst of this storm, and they saw him go down there for them. And I know I'm lifting the words, but the Lord has blessed it. From verse number 12, I know. You see, the men... The men on the I know who uttered these words, but these words were true. You listen now to this, for this is how a soul can be saved. Just now in this meeting, these men who stood on the side of the ship, as they watched Jonah go down into the water and into the storm for them, they could have said these words, I know that for my sake, this great tempest, this great storm is upon you. Or to put it in other words, they realized that there is one who went into the storm on their behalf. Had he not have gone into that storm, they would have perished. But because he went into the storm, and he bore the violence and the brunt and the waves of the storm himself alone, because he did that, those men were saved. Now tell me, dear friend, to stay with it, please. Can you take tonight your stand with me? You say, this is where I always, I can't see. Don't worry about seeing anything. Can you not take your stand with me this evening at Calvary? You and me alone. 
and see there upon that center cross the Son of God from heaven, the darling of his Father's bosom, and there upon that center cross the storm of divine wrath it broke on him, and the waves and billows of judgment that I should have borne, they rolled across him relentlessly. He went into that storm, and as I stand at Calvary, a guilty, hell-deserving wretch, I can say that I know that for my sake. This great storm was upon him, was for my sake. And you know what, dear friend? It was for your sake as well. That dreadful storm that was his at Calvary. All the judgment that you should have borne, it fell on him, and he went into that storm for you. You say, I know all that, but I'm not saved. I, and you know why you're not saved? You know why you're not saved? It's because you're... The, imagine these men. Now, just think with me here. With this... And maybe one other thing I'll finish. You imagine these men, and they, they've, rolled, they've rolled their arms out. They're doing their best. And they realize that's no use. And finally, they finally accept the plan of salvation. And this man goes into the storm for them. You imagine they throw, they throw Jonah into the water, and he goes into the storm, and they go, so they say, right man, right man, every man to the oars, and they row. That's what you're doing. You're saying, I know I can't save myself. I know I can't save myself. And I know, I know that the work of Christ on Calvary is all important and that on that cross he died for my sins, but I can't say I'm saved because there's something I'm missing. There's something that I don't see. I remember a fellow, I'm sure he was 40 if he was a day, speaking to him one day. He kept saying, he says, I don't see it. There's something I'm not seeing. There's something you're not telling me. I said to him, do you ever imagine that we've told you everything? And do you ever think there's nothing more for you to see? What you have to do is accept what you do see. That the death of Christ on Calvary's tree was not only for me, but that it's enough. And accept that it's enough. You say, but I am, and I have to believe. And how do I? Yeah, keep rowing. You will have to believe it. But while you're focused on your believing, you're just like these men, focused on rowing, rather than getting occupied with the one who went into the storm for you. If I could encourage any soul here, if you're not saved before you leave, I would say to you this, if the Lord spares you to your home, and may he do so, get occupied with Christ who went into the storm of Calvary. And those words we read in verse 12, I know that for my sake this great storm was upon him, and accept this dear friend that it is enough that Jesus died. You say, that's not all of the hymn. It says he died and rose again for me. Yes. What about, what about the one, what about the man who went into the storm, into the sea, into the wave? You say he disappeared out of sight. He did. You say he was never seen again. Well, no. Three days later he was seen. And I don't want to finish the meeting. It would be a crime if I finished the meeting just as we are now. But I want to tell you before we leave, the one who went into the storm at Calvary, you say he disappeared and wasn't seen. That's right. He was laid in a new sepulchre unseen. But I want to tell you, he came forth again. After three days, you know, this man Jonah, he went into a city and preached, and lots and lots, scores and scores of people were saved, thousands of them. You know, the Savior who went into the storm at Calvary, and who disappeared out of view, thank God, thank God, after three days, he was seen again. And he lives at God's right hand, and thousands have been saved, millions, all saved, 
because of the death of Christ and what he suffered at Calvary. And oh, that this night in this place, for I believe there's a soul here could be saved. Oh, that this night there may be one, another one added to the number of the redeemed. Now remember, just I leave you with this thought as I finish. Remember is not a new rowing harder. It's not in believing better or believing more. Get your mind off all of those things. Get your mind occupied with the one who endured the storm. And ask yourself the question, why was he there in that storm? If not for me, may the Lord bless his word. Our Father, we come near to thee in the precious name of the Lord Jesus. We pray that thou would bless thy word to some soul here tonight. We pray that there may be one quietly and simply receive Christ as their Saviour. Even now we commend the need of every unsaved soul to thee and pray for thy rich blessing upon each one. Preserve us as we each travel to our homes. Watch over us. Grant even that in the coming moments in thy will there may be a new name that will be written in the Lamb's Book of Life. We commend our need to thee and pray for thy rich blessing in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.